Um, welcome everybody to the spring roundtable for the CACC NBC chapter. Um, and thank you for the presenters for uh, agreeing to take some time out of their day to share their learning and knowledge with us. Um, my name is Sybil Hoist, and I'm joining you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Silks Nation uh, here in sunny Penticton. And uh, next up is uh, Carolyn Penner. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to share here with the you members of uh, CACCN, the BC chapter. And today I will be speaking about my role within Fraser Health. Uh, it's a transition clinical nurse educator for critical care. I am coming to you from Alder Grove, which is the traditional lands of the Katsi, Kwantlen, Matsqui, and Semiamu First Nations. So in this session, I'll just describe the creation, implementation, and the early feedback of the transition clinical nurse educator. I'm going to refer to it as CNE role for critical care. The overall goal is to improve recruitment and retention. So my head honestly was filled with all these ideas, plans for this role, but it was really difficult to know uh, that's a big task and how to roll out this position and where to start. As I would connect with novice nurses or go to the various ICUs in Fraser Health, I would hear, um, so who are you and what is it that you do? So who am I and how did I get to be into this innovative position? In many ways, I've had various roles throughout my career and they've all been, I think I can see now the connection and how they are a benefit to the support I provide now. I graduated from the VGH School of Nursing back in 1989. In my program, I had the opportunity to spend one month in ICU. And this is when I decided that ICU was going to be my destination. I started working for Fraser Health in 1990 at Surrey Memorial. I took my BCIT critical care and education in 1993 and then went into ICU at Surrey in 1994. Honestly, till 2015, I was a dedicated point of care nurse and never wanted to do anything else. I loved that role. Uh, and then I got a taste for... Um, working, I, I filled in as a CRN or clinical resource nurse. Um, and I suddenly saw a different side that I was quite interested in. So I went on to become a BCIT clinical instructor, uh, patient care coordinator, and then I was the full-time ICU CRN for a while. Most recently, um, Fraser Health started a critical care program and I was the CNE for Fraser South. Uh, in April of 2022, I joined the National Board of Directors for CACCN, and that's been beneficial in seeing a national focus on not just what's happening here in Fraser Health or the province, but right across our country and really, honestly, around the world. In May of 2022, so about a year ago, the new role of transition CNE was created, and I accepted that newly created role. So for today, I'm going to give you my report on the last 12 months in this job, very truly nursing style and in the form of an SBAR. So what was the situation? A staff line complement had become unbalanced in favor of novice critical care nurses and defined by any of those individuals who have engaged in under two years of practice following completion of their advanced training and education. As well, the demand for specialty education increased. Many nurses were coming into the critical care areas with less than two years of the traditional years put into med surge experience. Nurses with full competencies and experience were leaving the critical care units due to fatigue and burnout. Like all the things that Sharon had just said, the moral distress, the uh, concerns about safe, safe providing safe care, um, staff safety. Uh, resources within the units have been stretched. Uh, educators and resource, nurse, resource nurses are pulled to patient assignments. And in, in addition to that, I think uh, educators and resource nurses are just trying to get back into all the policies, procedures, everything that kind of got pushed to the side during the pandemic. The workload of the leadership within the units has also increased greatly. So Fraser Health is a large health authority that stretches from Hope to Burnaby. There are eight ICU critical care units within the health authority, as Sharon had said. 
So pre-pandemic specialty education seats were um, for critical care were through BCIT and about 45 per, per fiscal year. These seats were often under recruited by the units, I think in the 19, um, 2019, 2020 year, there was 33 nurses that went into critical care within the region. However, in September of 2020, uh, Fraser Health Executive uh, ordered the Fraser Health to start the new critical care in-house program. And there was the first grads were put into it, um, Fraser Health in December of 2020. So then in 2021, BCIT produced 44 grads and the critical care program 39. So this was more than double the novice nurses that were added to the region. So in a nutshell, there was no regional support and there was double the amount of novice nurses in our area. So because the health authority now had regional educators, this gave us an opportunity to do some follow-up. Um, it's a regionally based program. So we were able to go after the program, visit our nurses and say, how's it going? Um, as well, regional educators were sent to critical care units to provide clinical support as staffing complements had really become unbalanced. The graphic here depicts the average staffing ratio seen in one unit. The skill mix, the experience, vacancies, they would fluctuate, as did the acuity of the patients. Really, the information that had been gathered from these things were evident. The new programming plus increased recruitment had added novice critical care nurses to the unit in more greater numbers than had we had seen before. Follow-up visits were positively acknowledged by the novice nurses. I remember one saying, I can't believe you actually came to visit me. And then we did this trial support roles in some of the tertiary units, and it was identified that there's a need of support for novice critical care nurses. So as I said, in May of 2022, Fraser Health recognized that support and connection for novice nurses in critical care was needed, and the role of the transition CNE was created. So my assessment began with learning about the needs of novice nurses. In Judy Dusher's work, Transition Theory, Nursing the Future, she describes the steps that novice nurses experience as they begin their independent practice. And it starts with doing, so learning, performing the skills, learning the role, and being, examining, doubting yourself, questioning yourself within the role, and then knowing, recovering, critiquing, and finally accepting the new role. Uh, Dusher identifies the elements of transition as stability, consistency, predictability, and familiarity. And I laugh because how can we provide those elements right now in our critical care units? And if we could, there would be great opportunity for the building of skills, the building of knowledge, and the building of critical thinking. Uh, to continue with Dusher's theory of transition, novice critical care nurses require support. So a structured support that will evolve their thinking and their clinical practice. They also require a connection, some supportive relationships, feedback, opportunities for tacit knowledge transfer from uh, taking that thinking and putting it into that doing as well as they need practice. They need the time to practice under controlled, scaffolded and safe conditions. These opportunities have always been provided by mentors within the unit and mentorship still continues. However, as described, the availability of resources to provide the support and connection is becoming more limited, as well ratios of novice to experienced clinicians within the units is unbalanced. Uh, Burlew describes the multiple mentorship model in three phases or with three different mentors. So the phases are the training mentor, the education mentor, and the developmental mentor. The training mentor provides support to assist uh, the novice nurses um, in skills and processes required to do the job. To quote Burlew, the educational mentor has a broader role 
involving foresight and understanding of how one progresses in an occupation. A mentor at this stage looks towards the future and may help a worker with the following, plan for the future, make decisions about educational activities, related work experiences, et cetera, make contacts within successful professionals, work through hopes, dreams, and frustrations, succeed despite times of difficulty. The developmenter, developmental mentor provides the mentee with resources and support to visualize themselves in the future of the organization. Some of the activities would be assisting with self-assessment of strengths and weaknesses, and assisting to develop an individual plan of action, gaining insight into the future of the organization and helping to prepare for changes and providing guidance to the mentee to their professional development. So how did I see myself within these definitions? How could I use this information to provide practical support in the ICUs in our health authority? And I identified with the educational and developmental mentor um, and the descriptions of how I could provide that uh, professional development, that support, that, that kind of discussion of what had you hoped for and what were you experiencing. So I will admit that start try, to start a new role was difficult, and I didn't want to make assumptions about what I thought novice critical care nurses needed. So I sent out emails to all nurses working in critical care who had less than two years experience within our health authority. I think it was about 200 emails that I sent. So anybody that was, I considered novice, so under two years. Uh, for nurses that had less than six months, I asked questions specifically related to were they prepared? How was their orientation? Did they have mentorship? And what about their independent practice? Some of the questions that I asked were, were you able to apply the learned knowledge during your CNE orientation? Was there any extended orientation required? Were you able to practice independently after your preceptorship shifts? Did you require extra preceptorship shifts? If so, what was identified that what what was the need that was identified that led to these extra shifts? Were you assigned a mentor or mentors after your buddy shifts? And was this helpful? How long was the mentorship? Uh, for nurses within six months to two years, my questions were directed more towards how they visualized themselves in the novice role and the steps they had taken to advance their careers. As well, I asked specifically what would have assisted in the transition process. So just keep in mind that this group of nurses all experienced their transition and likely their critical care education during the pandemic. But these were some of the themes that were, were revealed um, from the feedback. So one, novice nurses wanted someone to provide clinical support. They felt overwhelmed, challenged by their assignments, and often felt that their coworkers were just too busy to ask them questions. They wanted to tell their stories um, just as a way of debriefing. They wanted to talk about their worst days, their sad days, and the exciting days. Um, I think that working in those conditions, you know, and as Sharon had talked about this moral distress, it was difficult to share with in the unit because everyone was experiencing it. So when I started reaching out, people wanted to tell me about this horrible shift that they had. And as an outsider, I hadn't heard their story. So they were so open to wanting to share that. But as a critical care nurse myself, I was able to understand and kind of help them to unpack all those feelings that they were having about it. Um, and then three, I was provided with feedback describing practical changes that could assist in the transition of novice critical care nurses. A few of the ideas that were brought up were um, novice nurse skills days or even simulations. Uh, the, the two things that they felt most uncomfortable with were assisting with intubations and admissions that came up quite regularly. Uh, they talked about early ACLS. They talked about being floated to other units within the first six months. <laughs> and there was a resounding theme. Do not be a novice critical care nurse during a pandemic. 
these are just some of the word uh, picture that I have there was just different words that I had picked out of a lot of the feedback that I got. So did I get a response from my emails? Uh, I would say overall about 40%. I, and it still continues that way. Not everyone replies to me. The likelihood of me getting a reply really increases if I've taught them or if they know who I am, or if they've talked to someone else that has talked to me, it's taking time for me to socialize this role. Of all those people that had replied, 50%, I'd say, still remain in just email communication. We email back and forth. They tell me about, um, you know, how it's going. They ask me for some resources or maybe uh, some courses that they can take, things like that. Of the other 50% of those replies, I meet with them either online, we do Zoom or Teams, or I go in person sometimes during a shift. If they, if it's more convenient for them, I'm happy to actually go see them in their actual working environment. And we just chit chat. Obviously, that's not, um, you know, a confidential private conversation. But it is good to say, hey, look at what you're doing. Look at you. Uh, you know, you're a real critical care nurse here. It's, it's um, fun for me. Um, so from the email replies, sometimes the discussion and the feedback from the unit c &Es as well, I added uh, clinical support shifts. I'm going to talk about that more in my um, recommendation part of this. I'm just um, to say that these discussions, all this information remained confidential. Um, a few of the comments that I got um, were... Yeah, can I talk about something that happened? So someone called me, it was, I don't know, in 7.30, I think they were driving home and they just wanted to talk about this day that they'd had. Um, oh, very recently, there was this nurse, she was so excited about this history and all these things that had happened to this patient. She'd admitted him, seen him through all these phases. And now when I looked at him, he looked great. He was up walking around and she was just so excited to tell me everything that had happened. And it was quite a, a remarkable sort of story and, and things. So um, it's fun. That part was really fun. She was just so thrilled to be a piece of that uh, from right from start to seeing the positive end result. Uh, comments that other people made. I can't see anyone, but I don't know how many of you have uh, memories of people that said something to you when you were a beginner. I remember very well an RT that said, do you even know what you're doing? And why do I carry that about 30 years later? But I do. And um and so I think still just being able to have someone to talk about that uh, with because people say things and it's not always warranted and um, and it can actually change how you feel about going into work. Um, I wish you were here yesterday. It was a crazy day. And, and that's OK, because I'm not really there to always provide that clinical support, but we talked about this and it was so when she started telling me things. I'm like, wow, you did all that, you know? And it was really good to kind of just have those conversations about uh, look at what you did. What could you have done differently? Look at your team, how they supported you, um, things like that. And occasionally I've had uh, people and we just meet and we'll set up like a few, maybe even weekly meetings, kind of just to go through some stuff that uh, nurses are processing and office nurses are processing. So my overall goal, as I mentioned, was both recruitment and retention. So I reached out to nurses who are also considering a, a career in critical care. I was able to obtain names and connect with nurses who were working as ESNs or had done a preceptorship in critical care. Uh, this connection introduced my role to them, provided an opportunity to answer questions, what steps might uh, needed to be take to provide the best foundation for working in ICU, what kind of, um, had they taken their ECG course, have they taken wound care courses, are they keeping up with their CPR, things like that. As well, they often had simple questions about programs or even where do I park, things like that. And um, I was just that connection that was easy to access. 
The majority of my pre-ICU connections were ner with nurses um, working in med surge transition lines and in the prerequisites for critical care. So in Fraser Health, we hire med surge nurses into the critical care units who work within their scope. Uh, this provides them the opportunity to experience the environment, the population, the charting, the PPOs, and get to know the staff. So in this role, they'll begin the uh, prerequisites for the critical care programs. <laughs> Making these early connections has provided me with an opportunity to develop a relationship early. And my overall goal is to be able to be a resource from really the beginning process of entering critical care and then throughout the process of transition from novice to experienced critical care nurse. So for the first three to four months, uh, the majority of my time was spent in making connections and having discussions. And I still continue to connect with nurses following their critical care and um, education at regular intervals. So I have sort of a standard email that I send um, to them post orientation, then at three months, six months, a year, and then up to two years. I ask if they want to meet, if they want me to come visit them, if there's anything. And like it's, it's, um, I try to, personalize it if I've met them before. Conversations and Zoom connections uh, really create a safe place to share stories, frustrations, fears, and also for me to provide encouragement. So it was through these conversations, I uh, was really led to the realization that I needed to go out and provide the support for novice nurses. The reason for some nurses reaching out to me is the same for what's being experienced right across our country. Staffing shortages, burnout, feeling overwhelmed, feeling unprepared, and fatigue. So I reached out to the ICU educators in the units and found shifts that um, were staffed with a few novice nurses, maybe ESNs, med surge transition nurses, really any mix of novice nurse and critical care. I spend a day in the unit working shoulder to shoulder, helping out the unit as needed. Uh, we have conversations. We talk about everything from priorities of care, skills, family support, to professional development and learning. Uh, one thing I do not do is I'm not involved in performance management. I want to be that safe person that they can talk to as they're working through things like that on their own. I'm also quite firm that I don't take a patient assignment or do transports, but that's on me. Uh, so looking to the future, I envision uh, creating communities of practice. So the purpose would be a way of connecting novice nurses. They can share their struggles and successes. They can share resources. They can say, oh, I found this really cool website, um, whatever it might be. And as well, I think there would be a big benefit in um, having skills and simulation days that are dedicated to novice nurses. It would provide, provide that, that safe environment for nurses to feel comfortable, to ask questions, uh, take that extra time for clarification. Um, if you're going and doing your ACLS or whatever it might be with someone that's got 10 years experience, you could potentially feel intimidated. And so um, having just maybe some of those uh, times when you can just do your own education with nurses that are kind of in a similar time frame as you. So here I am approaching one year in this role and I'm starting to look at back and evaluate. I know evaluation isn't part of the SBAR, However, as nurses, we're always evaluating our actions and adjusting our plans. Uh, so there's a few things that I've, I've uh, looked back on. Uh, so Fraser Health is in the process of changing the format of their competency document or a CAPE tool that's used for critical care. So we've developed a new competency and skills self-assessment. It's really a valuable tool for all nurses, but I think it's particularly valuable for me to share with novice nurses. To be able to see that they're tracking their progress, identifying different areas that 
they need to learn in. It's all part of who we are as professional professionals and our own professional development. I think it also encourages uh, nurses to independently seek out educational opportunities. Uh, they don't need to be told, oh, you need to know this. Like, this is part of who you are. What do I need to seek? What do I, what don't I know? What if a patient comes in with something and I don't know anything about that? So it helps them to identify that. Um, obviously, not everyone is going to be engaged in this process. I, I understand that. Um, and not at all stages too. Sometimes in the first three months, they are really just trying to acclimatize themselves to the role. But it's usually I've noticed between that uh, around six months, perhaps they're like, they want sicker assignments. They, they think that, oh, I'm not really getting um, the ones that I, I don't want to lose some of my learning, things like that. And so I really think it's helpful for them to be filling out, oh, these are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. I haven't had a lot of experience in that. It's just a way of documenting that. So I really encourage novice nurses to be aware of their proficiency levels and how they've progressed. Uh, they can present this and ask for more um, advanced assignments, and they can also see their own progress, which is, I think, um, rewarding. So as I continue to socialize my role, I connect with nurses prior to the education, and I do think that they are um, more likely to reach out to me then in their novice role. Uh, working alongside new nurses in ICU is probably my favorite thing that I do. It brings, brings me great joy seeing how they're applying their knowledge, working on their organization, their problem solving. It's like working with like we we talk like colleagues, which we are, and I, I find that just great. Um, so what else do I need to evaluate? I don't have data. I don't have anything to prove that this role is effective. At this time, I have anecdotal information from what's been said to me. I'm so glad you were here today. I had a bad day yesterday. Can we debrief? Someone said something to me and I'm feeling bad about how I'm perceived. While this is all valuable, it doesn't really re show recruitment and retention, which is the goals of my role. So this is still a work in progress. Um, I'm going to need to identify what are my desired outcomes, uh, something that's actually concrete, and create a formal process for all my connections. And as well, I started journaling. So I just kind of had bits of paper everywhere. And so now I've bought myself a journal and I've started writing in just kind of the things I've done and, and what was positive, what was negative about the, uh, these are mostly for my clinical shifts. Um, it's just a way of tracking the conversations uh, and even for me to process my own thoughts and concerns. Uh, sometimes it is concerning uh, that uh, novice nurses are feeling unsupported and, and it's not as a fault of anything. It's just the way that critical care units are right now. Um, so it's only been one week and I've already identified that I, I need to have some like quick resources because believe it or not, two shifts, there was a little bit of downtime. And I thought, oh, I should teach them something. What? <laughs> so this is something that I came up with. That I thought oh, I need to have like just in my back pockets, some kind of resources or something, some ready education that I can pull out. And these are the two resources that I was talking about that I used. And here I will stop sharing. And I just want to um, Welcome any questions, comments, and advice. Uh, quite honestly, this is a new role. It's still in development, and I am looking for any sort of feedback. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, just, I want to say that we are so, so happy to have Carolyn in the role that she is in. It has been so valuable for our new novice nurses, but also for us in the network to actually have somebody to be able to come and share with us hey, this is what's happening. This is what we need to look at. So it's, um, yeah, we need to clone Carolyn. We need about two more of her. <laughs> so that's our next step to work on. <laughs> but thank you, Carolyn.
Yeah, I'd echo what Sharon says too. From um, I'm CNE of Abbotsford ICU, and um, the feedback I get from staff about your role here and the connection they have with you is is really wonderful. I, I think it can't be downplayed how important this role is to the novice staff and um, to put in these supports for them so that they're successful within critical care and carry on in critical care. So thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Oh. Well, now all these nice things. I, I'm, I'm, I do accept like negative feedback too. anything. It's interesting. I was connecting with someone online um, uh, in Ontario and they're putting in, what did she call it? Like a clinical, it's like a clinical support nurse in med surge areas. And so they're looking to, you know, adding something. Hmm, she had a really good term for it, but it's gone from my head. Anyway, so I think I think it's um, hopefully going to spread, uh, you know, throughout um, province or country, because uh, like I said, the ratios are high novice to experienced. And I think it was great that Sharon spoke first as to why that is. Uh, you know, we're seeing just uh, changes in the dynamics of the ICUs around. So any way that I can support people to stay within critical care. Thanks, Carolyn. That was a, an excellent presentation. Uh, um, a couple of things that jumped out for me during that was um, how you're able to provide a, a bit of a sense of certainty for the new grads and um, just having everything be a little bit chaotic and as you're kind of rumbling with starting in critical care and um, all the things that you're exposed to you, you give them an you give them an outlet yes that. and you know I think people yeah. just want to be heard and I don't yeah. think that's that's um you know just only nursing I think that's true of all people um but they love to tell me a story and I love to hear the stories, uh, whether it's a good story or a bad story. I think people just want to have that outlet. And, um, and so, yeah, even if I just provide that, I often, I said the other day, I just love my job. I get to kind of drop in. I do what I consider princess hours, seven to three. I don't take an assignment. <laughs> I don't do transports. And um, however, uh, and I get to just kind of help out in the unit, but um, but just having that kind of personal connection with people has been, I think, a real uh, positive, definitely. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder if there's opportunity for that, uh, like leadership succession within units. So having mm. other direct care staff take on portions of that role within their own site have you thought about 100%, that 100% and i just yeah. and that has traditionally happened um i yeah. just think that uh post pandemic and um fatigue and senior nurses whether that's at 3 years whatever we consider a senior nurse now um i think they're tired yeah. and i think that there's been a lot of demands on them uh in the past few years so if I can sort of provide that outside support it's clinical coach that's the one that's the term that um in Ontario they're putting into their mm -hmm. med surge units anyway mm -hmm. I can also see what you've done as being really supportive to the current staff because that takes the load off them like you said they're you know very busy and um kind of burnt out themselves a little bit so that takes some of that pressure off of them. Yeah, and I think some it's it. very, very reasonable to ask a senior nurse, hey, I've never done this particular skill yeah. or, you know, they'll ask them a question. But but part of transitioning from a novice to more experienced critical care nurse is going through that critical thinking process. Mm -hmm. And I think that just me being there and talking to people through that, because you're not going to go and say to someone else, you know, I'm seeing like, it's just, they don't have time for that. So um, I think that's something that I can provide that maybe novice nurses just don't feel comfortable going and reviewing everything that they did like three months ago with their instructor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Thank you very much for sharing You're your welcome. story. And thank us. you for inviting me. Oh, yeah, really glad to have you here. Thanks for watching everyone and thank you for joining us on the BC chapter of the CACCN YouTube channel. I would suggest subscribe and hit the notification button so you can know when the next thing is out. Uh, and if you ever want to come to our next event, 
We're on Facebook and on Instagram. Our links are listed below. And while I'm on the topic, if you're a critical care nurse anywhere in Canada, why don't you join CACCN? We have a ton of resources to help you be the best critical care nurse you can be. Go to CACCN.ca and join us.